everyone will agree we've got a great lineup of lectures today there's something here for everybody I think um, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Sarah and to, to David for putting together such a, a great collection of lectures for us Noon, we're going to go back to the physical layer again um, and our first lecture comes from um, uh, via V solutions and it is from Matthias Jun um, now, Matthias is part of the e, um, MEA Solutions Consultant Team uh, for VIAV Solutions in charge of business development for HFE test instruments and service assurance portfolio, covering HFC operators in UK and Northern Europe. He's based in Stockholm. So, can you give a warm welcome to Matthias? who is going to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. So I'm based in Stockholm, but I'm French, and so it's a bit of a mix. I hope my French, English, Swedish language will be okay for this uh, early step the afternoon. Um, so I'm uh, stepping in, uh, in the slot. First, first, I wanted to know if uh, everybody knows uh, about Viavi. Um, so it's a new name, but so I'll make that, that slide just to make sure maybe you heard of us. So we were former GDSU, former Acterna, former WebTech as well. So it's about 30 years plus and some, some of the, the guys in the room know. And since last year as well, we bought a Trilitic portfolio, which was our, one of our main competitor, but it was as well a 30 year cycle because one of the founders of the Trilitic was a former WebTech. Um, so the business unit for the AV solution for the cable industry is based from Indianapolis, uh, US. So what um, HFC actually is um, a hybrid fiber coax network is a big uh, is a big step forward today and very challenging uh, environment. Is a lot of change technology wise uh, coming up and uh, that could be uh, overwhelming for, for the network. But um, uh, the number one driver is, uh, is, is still the broadband demand and the growth of that. Uh, which bring it off uh, a driving explosive not counts when you want to, to deliver that uh, broadband access. So I, I made a quick example we, we took out from a, a light reading cable next um, in 2017. It was just a lighting two example from the US base uh, about the number of uh, optical fiber nodes Comcast, Comcast or Cox was uh, planning to deploy over the next uh, four or five years. And you see the numbers, they are quite uh, over overwhelmed over 1 million additional optical fiber nodes uh, for, the, for the big operator in the US. Even for Cox, that's from 25,000 to 200,000. So it's a, it's a multiply by tenfold <coughs> just for, for the spread over four or five years. So to bring that, you know, the, the methods to use the traditional method in, in HFC. So I don't know if my audience is, uh, is well aware of that. Maybe some, some of them were from Virgin Media, no, no pretty much that. Traditional method: what to do not splitting to, to provide higher bandwidth to the to the end user. So per node, if you if you reduce the number of subscriber, then you can share that bandwidth, which is a share bandwidth uh, between between the customer to to bring up uh, the, the speed. 
But the traditional way is uh, splitting nodes. It brings a lot of uh, a cost in the upside, where you need to, to, to bring up more and more power, more combining uh, equipment, more and more uh, space for the, for the CMTS to build up. So at the end of the day, these upsides, they are as well limited. And uh, so when I call like bring up this, this nice equation of uh, where to drive from uh, bandwidth demand to uh, reducing the number of uh, service group for the downstream um, uh, bandwidth, so reducing the number of uh, subscriber per nodes, that's mean increasing the number of nodes, increasing the number of uh, CMTS ports, combining, increasing the rack space, increasing the power, increasing the cooling in a hub to accommodate. And some of the aspects here is that the hubs are pretty full. So in some way, you have to bring up a kind of new architecture we call distributed access architecture for DA uh, to bring up this, this space constraint to be deeper inside the field. The other benefits by bringing this new architecture is that you can bring a uh, higher optical link between the hubs and the nodes, uh, moving from analog fiber to digital fiber optics. So a, a better SNR, a more robust link, and uh, some of it, it's as well a lower cost uh, deployment. And traditionally as well, that's you go deeper in architecture, which is an Ethernet-based architecture, which can be commonly used for business access or 5G deployment as well in the future. And if you do that, this kind of change of technology moving on distributed access architecture, with the introduction of DOCSIS 3.1, which uh, bring more bits per hertz in the spectrum, and you can have the both benefits of this architecture. And you could see rapidly, I mean, I've been in this year, last year, three years ago, is a lot of talk about remote fire devices and remote fire, especially the, um, uh, the name, but they're driving a lot of marketing towards that. And, and we're coming up now to see more, I think probably in Europe as well, more and more um, operators to push there to distributed access architecture. So I come from uh, Sweden, but we're focusing in Denmark. And uh, since the last two years, they have been uh, launching a nationwide, a countrywide distributed access architecture based on a, on a Huawei system in Denmark. So it's possible and it's already operational today. So this is the second step change. The third step, I just step on it, I will not talk today of DOCSIS 3.1, but DOCSIS 3.1 bring a higher modulation scheme around the FDM and extension of frequency, so there's a lot of spectrum. Uh, but at the end of the day, the SNR still, still uh, matters. So if you have a good network, if you have a good SNR, that will be the benefits as well to bring higher bandwidth to your subscriber. And the last point usually is that uh, the MSOs as well, they are driving forces as well from uh, 5G, I mean, everybody's talking 5G wireless, and as well, FDX stands for full DOCSIS, which is the next DOCSIS deployment on a node plus zero architecture. So for symmetrical DOCSIS, bring you up maybe to the, the barrier up to 10 gig uh, delivery to the home. So it's, it could be an opportunity for cable MSOs. I would say that uh, you know the distribution of 4G cells density uh, become much more dense on a higher bandwidth, higher uh, as we say frequency used by the 5G. So you have much more need uh, smaller cells to deploy. So the remote fire decentralized architecture could be a good fit as well for for cable operators to to have a, a piece of the cake on the 5G deployment. On the drawbacks, I would say on the challenge is a comma, as well as we are test and measurement company, but operation-wise, um, challenging is from the test and, uh, and maintenance of this uh, uh, new deployment system. Uh, the technician operation is always change is hard, so you don't want to, to have several new tools and to drive from existing system to a new system and have to change or have diversified method or procedure to be changed. And of course, you have now coming up as many simultaneous changes at the same time. It's even harder for the text ops to, to fulfill. And I, I just, um, yeah, highlighting there, it could come as, as one shot of several shots, several phases all together. So it's a very uh, draining as well on this operation to wrap training the tech team or even the tools just to, you know, to maintain this kind of network where several new technology could bring up together. So one, one aspect, and that's why the topics today about uh, distributed access architecture. So just to highlight mostly on the, I would say, like cable business. That was, so it just a light for 
people not too aware what was we call about a C cap or CMTS, which on the left side to a fiber node to a cable RF plant, where you have a distributed ar architecture to bring the RF to the to the home. So the the, the link is between the C cap and the fiber node, and some of the function will will shift from from one side to another to go deeper and deeper inside the network. So this is still the centralized access architecture, and that will remain most of operators around the world still. Uh, uh, probably a majority of nodes will still remain as it is, because cost effects difficult to um, uh, to modify. But some uh, some of the key area or some of the new area that we're going to bring is to shift as well for saving cost in in the hub space, power or cooling gain, shift, shifting what we call the the, the cable physical layer uh, towards the field test instrument. So from the C cap, that functionality has been moved back to the right side in the fiber nodes. Why we call it remote five for remote physical layer. Um, so that brings two, two aspects there, is that the RF stop at the fiber nodes and not going back to the to the head end side. So that's a key aspect as well for the for the monitoring aspect or what is built today. So we and you have a differentiation and a new interface to to, to be worked up from the field instrument. The field, uh, we said, field teams to the Eden, Eden guys. Uh, this kind of architecture bring the smallest, I would say, of, of the three I'm going to present today, uh, f the smallest of the gains because uh, it's only one one piece of layer that is uh, distributed. And but on the other side, you know, the MOX complex feature remain inside the close end of the operators, so it could be easier as well for them to manage and to do that transition. And today, this method is very used by the largest uh, CMTS vendors, uh, which uh, we were strong in the CMTS side and pushing uh, remote fire devices into, into the field. So you have much more today offers on the remote fire that you have on the different architecture that I present next. The second layer, where we call remote MAC fire, when you have the cable MAC, so the second layer of the access uh, will be placed inside the fiber nodes. So you, you have a, a bit more gain in terms of spacing. And, uh, and, uh, and, and one key aspect is that there's a lot of timing issue between the two physical and the, and the MAC layers. So if you co-located this into, into the field, you have a less troubleshooting there. Uh, this, this path is, is already presenting by some, some of the names. And as well is the next step to a transition where we call uh, virtual C, C, C cap as well, where the functionality to the left side will be virtualized and going further down the line. And uh, the, the, I would say the third architecture where we mostly use is called remote C cap, where most of the features from the C cap driving the RF are based in the fiber node and remain on the, on the head end side, mostly the interface to the to the internet. So every every management there is driving inside the, uh, the cabinet into the into the nodes. So this kind of architecture, for example, is the one uh, driving through a Huawei system. So sometimes the new incomers they bring it this kind of a new architecture. So the, the offer today is small, but you have a starting a, a good amount of vendor to 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 bring it there. And the advantage here is it's more self-contained. So everything is self-contained into the nodes. On the other side is you have a more complex instrument inside the, the cabinets, in the street cabinets. So it's always a, a, a drawbacks and advantages there. So this is uh, uh, just as a summary. Um, I've been following an Aris webinar a couple of months ago, and there were six to eight different flavors between Remote 5, Remote Mac 5, Remote CCAP, all together. So it's a lot of flavor that can be done in the industry, and we'll see how, how the MSOs will, will choose and uh, what kind of solution will be driven. But it's a lot of piece that can be moved from one side to another and, and, to, be, and to be deployed. As a new challenge um, of bringing this kind of a new flexibility, I would say, in, in terms of offer, is that you have a new DMARC points between what was before a domain reserve from the Eden engineers to the field engineers, because you know some of the functionality, depending on the architecture, the complexity become much more deeper inside the network. So it, it could be as well a way for the for the work group to, to be changed or to be adapted 
uh, to avoid a bit, uh, finger pointing between you know what is uh, high skill engineering to field, field technician. Uh, the second aspect is that the technician you have to bring more fiber or Ethernet skill and not only RF oriented because the RF part is becoming less and less, and they have more and more Ethernet or fiber capability to be testing inside inside the node. The third aspect of it is that you could have a mix of these different architecture in a single network because you could have a, one solution fit well in one area and another solution fit well in, a, like we said this morning, on the most urban area compared to the rural area. So you could have a, a proliferation of a different architecture there. Uh, and I, I will bring as well the, the last two points will be uh, timing concern and the area removal, just show you next on the on the slide. So this is could be the new barrier or the new interface to to um, to interface between the two groups. Uh, the next evolution, as well, is um, as uh, as we mentioned. This is a, an overview to to highlight. The top one was the traditional uh, where the Mac file are collocated in the hub with the CCAP, and if you spread out the Mac and the file layer, so the file will go deeper in the network and the Mac could go higher back in the head-end. So you spread out this physical layer between uh, the centralized system head-end to the, to the field um, uh, deployment. You can go one step in, in the future to go even further back where the CCAP could drive up to the data center and you can have a bunch of virtual uh, CCAP system there, very uh, on the common hardware platform. So you, you, you could see that the extension and even my, uh, my marketing guy mentioned that this new word as head-end uh, re-architecture as a data center, where the two function as a data center head-end, the head-end itself not becoming any more head-end oriented for RF, but can be head-end um, data center driving of any access network. Because at the end of the day, between the, the head-end data center to the remote file, this is an Ethernet-based network. So very common to access as well for the uh, over operation, not only RF side, for the cable side. So when we talk about this with the access architecture, there's a lot of benefits. I think the main driver um, is, is that space requirement, power and cooling, that's a huge cost. If, you, if you're driving high bandwidth, that's a huge cost. Um, I, I listed there the higher bandwidth per hertz, the optical link that bring a lot of uh, benefits there. And the, the main flexibility as well is the flexibility that you have is because you're not attached to one vendor. There's a lot of things in decentralized architecture that you can mix and pick and choose the best uh, remote file devices with the best CCAP vendors. And there's a lot of uh, interop which have been driving off the forces there. So it gives much more choice for the MSOs to, to deploy in, in a different area. Yeah, one key aspect I wanted to show here is on uh, if you implement as well a D DWDM on the 10 gig network, you could as well define uh, several paths for remote file devices for cable, but you can use the same the same uh, upside to, to deploy as well uh, OLT and EPON network as well to driving your business services or ever maybe 5G wireless as a, as a future proof upside world. So you, you, you can have the benefits of it backhaul platform to drive different different uh, uh, access model. On uh, I've been already touched base on the challenges, as well as benefits and challenges. One of the key aspects is the complexity that you bring to the field. Sometimes you bring a, a bit more complex instrument and a bit more costly instrument as well, which is going to be deployed in the cabinet, on the street cabinet, which is not under closed door, which is uh, 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 accessible, not very secure. So one of the key aspects, I mean, probably not in the UK, but uh, um, my colleague from uh, South America was thinking that the operator there, they were, they were scared about people stealing the, the, the equipment and reselling to the other countries. So, so one of the key aspects there, because uh, the cost is slightly more important. Um, the second aspect is about the IT and data security concern, because you bring that di 10 gigabit um, optical link to the to the fiber streets. We're not, not uh, secure, so every can be typing um, from uh, from this feed. Uh, the third one is this overall power. So we say we reduce the power inside the hub, but overall, 
do you risk having a much more power on the, all these devices that you spread out all over the network? The last point usually is about the updates. So from the Eden guys, uh, they used to have a full control of their CMTS. They know when they bring the upgrades to the CMTS. Now if you have a deploying thousand or thousand of devices in the field and launching a massive upgrade, where are we gonna touch base of oh, sleeping at night when you have these uh, issues on spreading all over the countries? And the, the last point is about uh, disruptive to, to maintenance. So there are a lot of people in operation team. Of course, it's a, a new technology, new benefits, but it's changing a lot of their, uh, we said, routine and process or to drive this uh, um, maintenance to this instrument. So I'm gonna touch base on one uh, where we are more focused as, as VIV because we were um, supplying you know, test um, equipment into the field for um, the, the field tech. So either for, for the leakage testing or for the um, RF testing and ingress suppression. So uh, today on our traditional system on the top, top end, uh, you have the RF return to the field and we have uh, some spectrum analyzer testing the return path. And as well, we have a lot of points to inject, you know, um, telemetry or a tiger for the, the leakage to be streamed out into the field for using on our field, field instrument. If, if you bring the distributed access architecture at the bottom, suddenly your 10 gig Ethernet, there's no more RF into the hub site. So all this traditional method or equipment we have de deployed for 20, 20 plus years, they are not uh, usable directly. So we need to find a way to, to transfer from these uh, blocking, blocking points that have no RF to bring more, because the need from the field tech is still is still there. They still need the same tools, even if you uh, bring up remote fire deeper into the network, it could still be a cascade of five to six amplifier, active amplifier to be aligned to suppress the, the noise into the RF plant, and they need tools to do that, and the traditional tools wise to use from, from centralized system. So we, we're migrating offers and uh, we try to find solution to to reuse the capability into the, into the remote fire to do, to do the challenge. So the, the main approach on the leakage, so if you, if you use a leakage tester, is to have the, the tiger directly uh, streaming from the remote fire devices. And this is uh, today available, I would say, on, on the main um, remote fire vendor to have this capability to use the, the right tiger to be linked to the existing equipment you have been used in the field. There's one aspect about the leakage. The second one is about the downstream sweep. We're gonna use the, the fully loaded plan to align the network on, on the downstream. We can use a kind of net technology like a sweep less sweep on our instrument to do that. About the upstream sweep is a capability from the instrument to sweep back in the return to verify the, the noise and if you have any, any um, impedance mismatch. Um, this is where we want to virtualize the solution inside the remote fire devices and to create a new uh, agent between the remote fire devices and our management system as a path track or expert track system. And finally, for the uh, return path as well, we're gonna virtualize the spectrum return from the remote fire device by the cable labs, I would say technology that bring it up. So the idea there is that you bring the remote fire devices not only for uh, bring up additional um, let's say, this kind of device, we're gonna deploy video, doxies, carriers, video carriers, um, but as well, they can reuse as a test tools as well, virtual test tools uh, for, for the field tech in, and, and to make, um, maintain, how we say, the process and tools they were using inside the RF network. So I'll try to highlight this one in a, in a more simple way. Um, so that's, uh, if, I feel if I don't lose you on that, on that slide. Um, so expert track is our, I would say, a management system on the, I would say, written path monitoring platform. And the Hoenix, or one expert, is our field instrument as a, a RF um, tools in the network. So especially this diagram is about uh, spectrum, written spectrum, and, and uh, written sweep. And sweep is, is, an act, is a quicker way to align the network by using sweep points uh, generating from the field instrument. 
and measure them back and send it back to the field technician to verify that if he's done his job where you can see the noise coming or the impedance and it can drive up inside the RF network. So one traditional way could be to use an external box uh, to, do the, uh, to do the job between, uh, say, RF feeds, digital it, and bring it back to the CCAP. But as we see, we're not scaling up very much, and uh, is to bring another piece of hardware inside the, inside the model. So, so we decide to go uh, directly on the virtualization directly inside the remote fire devices. So the, the way to activate, if as you have a downstream telemetry, which is activated from the remote fire devices, telling the instrument that you can sweep. When the field technician receives it, it can, the instrument will send back an upstream telemetry as a two-way communication back to the remote fire devices, and it will drive back the information to expert track servers, so as a telemetry API. Then the, the expert track will tell him which uh, sweep plan you can use on the instrument to activate the sweep points based on where you stand in the network, based where the DOCSIS carriers are. So it's a, it's a two bypass communication, and then you can activate the spectrum on expert track, and you can activate the sweep points around the DOCSIS carriers there. So instead of going out of band, we, we go inside band, and we use uh, NDF, NDR, narrow digital return, and forward as a cable lab um, um, standard to, to uh, exchange with the remote fire devices between expert track and, and the remote fire devices. So now the remote fire devices is the source of the telemetry, is the source of the measurement coming from the field instrument, is the source of the spectrum where we can visualize the written path uh, from that node. So a lot of questions have been coming from the, the customer and the, and the name. So we, we, we're implementing a new certification process in the, in the next SET Expo in uh, October in the US. And, and we will have a two, two type of uh, a gold and a silver a DA test ready with a VIV solution on that virtualization. So gold will we, we make that uh, the partner have been validating end to end with uh, this uh, all a new system and the silver that they have a roadmap to, to do it. So that will be, um, uh, will be announced in, uh, in a couple of weeks time. So that was for, we say, remote fire and uh, spectrum and sweep. Um, I want to touch base on the second aspect, which is about uh, remote fire uh, timing synchronization. So I mentioned the, the different challenge, and one come to, to the point is uh, network timing, especially when you separate this layer between Mac and the file layer. <coughs> So if you spread out the, the, the file to the nodes and, uh, and the Mac as a virtual CMTS come back to the Eden, the hub could be seen just as a switching, uh, switching equipment. But you need to, to, to keep the synchronization inside the network for uh, the DOCSIS uh, protocol to be still used between cable modem and CMTS. So um, we transfer that as a, we call PTP, as a, um, a protocol, timing protocol inside the network. So if you, um, if you have your grandmaster, um, a source of the true timing, it should be spread around the virtual CMTS or the CMTS, the CCAP, or the remote fire devices for timing synchronization. And these devices, the remote fire devices, they send through DOCSIS uh, timing protocol, uh, the timing requirement to the cable modems. Because it's very important on the return path when the cable modem is, is picking an uh, ATDMA. Um, transfer that they need to speak only when the slot is allowed. So you should have a timing synchronization there. And the requirement for this in, uh, in a physical and DOCSIS is about one millisecond alignment for the cable modems to, um, to, to be aligned. So not doing so, the, so in, in the past, this uh, physical layer and the MAC address, where, uh, MAC layer where they tied together in the, in the CCAP, so it was less less an issue for the uh, a piece of network in between. So now if you, if you separate it, and um, if you fail to, I would say, synchronize the remote fire devices, you could have a spread out of the wrong timing to the back to the cable modems. So this is just to highlight the fact that if um, the remote fire device is two compared to the remote fire device is one, it's slightly delay, 
then the Cabot modem subscriber one could be slightly delayed compared to the number two. And if they transmit together at the wrong time, you could have a congestion based on a network. And that congestion could be seen from the virtual CMTS as a bit error rate from the RF plant as actually is not an RF issue, is more a network issue inside the, inside the network or a fail of synchronization, timing just synchronization. So it becomes a bit more critical for the operation team to troubleshoot this kind of issue because now they, they think there's an RF, they could check the RF side, it won't, it won't tell them it's an issue on the RF side, and you will still have a lot of issue on the virtual CMTS because of that. So it's a key priority as on a deployment on remote file devices to verify the timing synchronization between all these devices. The third aspect is about, uh, usually it's about flexibility, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good way for the MSO, so you can have a lot of competition. There's a lot of a market now, you have a lot of uh, vendors um, who could propose solutions, so it's, it's quite uh, easier for them to choose and to, f to fit the right solution of some part of the network. On the other side, it can create a lot of planned distribution that is not very much standardized. So you can still have the analog fiber centralized access network. And if you start on some uh, greenfield nodes, you could decide to say, I'm going for remote fire devices there. But the technician could be on a one day coming from the centralized nodes to verify uh, an issue on a RFI node in the afternoon, and they have to deal with that. So if he has tools not to use on both hands, it become a bit critical. And it could be even uh, bo worse or better is that you know, you could implement as well another technology if you go for a rural area where the distance are a bit longer and you probably want to have maybe remote MicFi as, as a technology compared to uh, remote Fi. Or you can think maybe in a very uh, building area that is better to have you know, a remote CCAP solution instead of a remote Fi or remote MicFi. So it could be as well a different vendor because they are a better solution than your traditional um, a name vendor for, for your centralized architecture. And on the fourth step, it could be in two years time that you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna do not plus zero. And you need a, a smaller footprint of the five devices, uh, which is not fitting the first one, maybe not the second one. So you could have another vendor uh, deploying just for that type of architecture. So in a couple of years time, you could have a mix of very many different architecture and you still have your main operation team to drive this of a different system, different monitoring tools, a different uh, test and validation for this kind of system. Co could be flexible in some way, but troubles, more troubles as well to maintain on, on the long run. So that's where we stand as well, I would say, as, as the IV, as a, as a measurement to drive and to help um, with our test and solution to uh, try to maintain agnostic solution compared to the name you, uh, you're choosing. I'm uh, conscious of the time, I'm still good. <clears throat> so my last uh, two slides about uh, remote file is about uh, testing and the roll-up uh, and the process consideration or when you're deploying remote file. So it's about the four phases, about um, first the Eden hub construction. So of course you have to test and verify the your network equipment installation. So it becomes from Ethernet and transport test system to the optic system, even to the GPS antenna system for, for timing synchronization. Um, as you not you want to deploy the remote fire device into the field, you want probably to test remote fire shelf inside the hub or inside the Eden first. So first to characterize the RF, to verify the DOCSIS services in the case of technology before, and verify the video and maybe the voice testing as well prior to, to dispatch. Then you have the fiber construction uh, or fiber, uh, pulling the fiber, fiber characterization, if you use for DWDM a technology as well, you may have to, to run an OTDR functionality there to, to verify the, the, the right functionality. Finally, when you install the remote fire devices, um, you have to run, again, fiber inspection, verify the cleanliness of your, of your optics, um, testing Ethernet, testing the protocol, timing protocol, as, as mentioned and everything around the RF side, because that's the only point where you're gonna test RF uh, in the future. So where is the RF? Where's the DOCSIS testing, the video testing? And if you activate the sweep capabilities, that's the point as well to test it. 
And finally, about the maintenance, you won't have the tools to, to still driving your workforce when you have a, a lot of RF testing to be done. So still supporting leakage capabilities, ingress suppression, uh, video testing, and as well uh, protocol, uh, time protocol testing. On a day-to-day -day or in a monitoring phase, like uh, service assurance testing for fiber or for Ethernet or for HFC network. So in terms of assurance testing, uh, I will not detail too much. I think you will have the slide. Um, just spread out what is Ethernet monitoring compared to fiber monitoring to PNM track, uh, what we offer on our expert track system for FEC, driving our statistic against the, the CMTS and the subscribers, and what is uh, ingress suppression for spectrum and written, written path monitoring. So every tool which we use for centralized architecture can be reused. And you will see the test is just extended compared to the point you want to test. But the same tools and the same uh, assurance system can driving, uh, let's say, traditional architecture to new decentralized architecture. And my last slide, I will not detail too much. I will go. So I realize it was a lot of click now. So <laughs> I will not detail too much. But that is almost the full range of products that VIV can, can propose in terms of service insurance on the left side to fill instrument on the right side for the different type of areas. So from fiber monitoring to metro and internet testing to the HFC monitoring uh, tools to the instrument that we deploy for tests um, in the field. So fiber instrument, Ethernet instrument, and all the HFC instrument there. So it's a good opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of change. Access is still a, a good way, and we, the MSOs, they're driving the fiber deeper, deeper in the network. But the remaining part of the FF part is still, is still there to be tested and, and to verify to the end subscriber if you want to guarantee that gigabit delivery to the home. So I will finish uh, as um, this, this uh, short uh, presentation. We, we ran a webinar series uh, recently. Actually, the first session was last week. I think you can still register to get the recording. Um, it was uh, Comcast speaking on that session, especially on their deployment of uh, decentralized architecture. So quite, quite interesting on their plan. I mean, it's not very much Comcast is... Uh, is, is Always the reference, but it's not very spread out that you can reuse exactly what they're doing everywhere. But uh, they have a nice introduction. They go mostly, mostly for not plus zero architecture. But uh, um, it was an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, they've done a lot of uh, interop issue as well with remote fire devices there. Yeah. You have two extra sessions, one in November and one in January, on these topics about uh, remote fire devices and uh, decentralized architecture. So I invite you, you, and you have the link on the, on the different session to um, to be able to uh, register. And uh, we'll have uh, Aris coming and uh, Cisco and Harmonic as well. So it's a bit spread off of the, of the name to, to be associated with. And I was worried to be on time, but I'm probably almost on time. So if you have any question, I don't know if we do the question afterwards, but um, thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you.